The microchip, as, as you heard, has been the engine of information processing. And uh, the reason that there has been such tremendous progress in the microchip is that the physics of transistors, the little devices down inside the microchip that actually perform the operations on the information, it was possible to make those much smaller than people imagined. And uh, at the time, of course, that was considered impossible, like all things are in the beginning. The number of transistors and the rate at which they process information has increased exponentially with time over the last 30 or 40 years, maybe 50 now. So that's how I got into the information revolution, was, was figuring out that the transistors could get smaller and faster, and there could be many, many more of them on a microchip, and therefore we could process information much faster and at much lower cost. You can't make a system that works without understanding the principles that make it work, and the the better you understand those principles, the better system you can make. So every really good engineer is forced to become a scientist on many occasions because you can't do what you need to do without understanding better what's at the bottom. And every scientist who really wants to understand how nature works has to build real experiments and build real things that work in order to determine what's going on down at the bottom. And so I've never been able to decide whether I was a scientist or an engineer. Uh, and it's also true when you build something that works, the only way you know if it really works is if it does some good for people in the world. And if it does some good for people in the world, that's the basis of a good business. One of the reasons that I spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley in California was that it was a place where it was not a disgrace to fail. Everyone understood that if you're going to try leading edge things, most of them don't work out. There's no shame in that. You learn something from them and you go on. I used to have um, research group at the university, maybe 20 graduate students and postdoctoral fellows and people like that. We would have a meeting every week to discuss what was going on in the group and people that had made progress would report on it. But at the very beginning of every meeting, we had a very special event, it was called Confession. And what it was, was if any of us had done an experiment that didn't work, we were obliged to report on it first before anything else. Now, why would we do such a thing? I mean, it's embarrassing. You do something and it doesn't work out. Well, the reason you report on it is then no one else has to make the same mistake. That turned out to be the most powerful thing about those meetings. Far more of your ideas will not work than the ones that do work. But from every one that doesn't work, you'll learn something. And that will guide you in the next thing to do. It's very hard on the ego, but it's very, very helpful on the brain. In my own career, I've had far more failures than successes. And one of the things I always tell young people is, you will learn far more from a failure than from a success. Uh, you probably see people in the news that have started some company, it's become some overnight success, and the person goes around and pretends like they're 
the smartest person in the world. And what I say to young people is, I, I hope that doesn't happen to you because it will ruin you for life. If you have an instant success that you don't have to struggle for, you don't have to experience failure, you won't learn very much. And you might learn the wrong things. There are many ways to discourage people who, who have an idea early on. And uh, planning is one of the most effective ways to discourage people with bright ideas. Some people think you can plan it. And I would like to caution you that this process cannot be planned. It's opportunity driven, not planning driven. There's a cultural resistance to allowing the process of people trying things and not having it happen the way they think and having it fail a lot of the time and it's a very uncertain, very chaotic process. But that's the way innovation works. By definition, an innovation is something that people hadn't thought of yet. And it's going to sound crazy to people, to most people. So what you can do as a culture is to swallow really hard and try not to squash the ideas down when the young people have them. And yeah, they'll do a lot of foolish things. And one out of 10 or 20 or 50 of those foolish things will turn into a big success. And everybody will say, well, that was the smart person. The rest of them were all dumb. No, no, no. That was a person. They were all smart. But that was a person who, who was smart and lucky and persistent. What takes time is getting a, a culture where young people can be uh, can find ways to get their first funding, can find people, more experienced people to help them along without discouraging them, uh, can be in a social structure where if their company doesn't work, they aren't uh, considered uh, failures and socially unacceptable. Uh, I, think it, I think it's more that, that, that social change, I think, is harder than the, the transition from an idea to a, a commercial enterprise. This is one of those times when the pressures from an industrial point of view to make smaller and smaller aggregates of matter, to make smaller transistors, to make smaller um, magnetized regions to store information, that sort of thing, that has led to a technological capability that allows us to do scientific experiments much better than we've ever been able to do it before. So there's a symbiosis uh, between science and, and commercial technology in both directions. And this is one of those uh, extraordinary times when we can't really see what the next big thing is until we get there.